let's just start with the idea that they're all a bunch of investors, right? Right. This idea that you were aligned with the other HOA, with the other owners mm -hmm. of the majority, and it's not a resident owned HOA as much. They're going to make decisions in the best interest of an investor, mm -hmm. right? Tell me more about that. Yeah. Well, so I, can I share a little story about the downsides of an HOA? Yeah, please. Let's, let's start with how it can go wrong. Okay. This is my very first property that I ever bought was a condo in Jack's beach. And this is the one that I, we talked about how you can raise money or how you can buy properties, even if you don't have any money. Well, this is one that I worked out a partnership with my dad as the lender. And we put this pro forma together business plan and borrowed money in order to buy this one. Well, so there was a lot riding on the line for this condo that I was buying. I didn't really investigate the condo association, the homeowners association. That was like the last thing that I was thinking of at that time, but I'll tell you why it's important. So we bought this condo and the condo association fees were $175 a month. And I priced that into my pro forma and I was going to live there for a little while and then I was going to rent it out. Well, the very next month, I had literally not even owned it a month yet. The next time that the payment came up for the, the condo association dues, I saw a fee there for $325, like literally almost doubled, right? 150 times 12 is 1800 bucks a year, right? An additional 1800 bucks a year in costs. And I was like, what just happened here? And we had a condo association president <laughs> who I did not agree with, but I found out too late. And he wanted to do all of these things to this condo association, spend all of this money and spend an additional $1,800 times however many condos we had in order to pay for it. Well, when that happens, right, that affects the value of your asset because those costs affect affordability if people are going to be living there themselves. And it definitely affects what the returns are going to be if an investor would like to buy those properties and try to cash flow. Like that's an additional $1,800 of cash flow you probably just can't make out of thin air in rental income. So I saw that and I was like, oh my goodness. So I, I held that property for a long time. There was nothing I could do about the condo association fees, right? I said, hey, I don't think this is right. I showed up to the board meeting, but I was one vote out of however many owners we had. I didn't have super shares, right? The board of directors and the votes for everybody else came in and they still said that they wanted to spend that extra $1,800 a year. And so that was a big learning lesson for me. I said, well, that's that and relating it to control. Like that's an example of not having control. That's how things can go bad in an HOA. And when folks are thinking about buying a property with JWB, that's one of the questions like, ah, I don't want to have an HOA. It's not because an HOA can't serve a purpose or do something really great for your property. We can talk about the ways that it can but you're fearful of that condo association president coming in the next year and saying, listen, your condo association fees were X. I'm going to double those yeah. because I'm going to put in a fancy gate and a swimming pool and yeah. the Taj Mahal. Yeah. Right. So it goes back to that fear of control. And it's something that we have to pay attention to. You have to pay attention to if you're buying a rental property, you have to do that due diligence on that HOA, right. Or at least understand the influences that are affecting the HOA just like you're doing it if you're going to be investing with Shopify for the 40% voting yeah. super shares yeah. for their CEO or Elon Musk, right? Or the operator for the syndication. Mm -hmm. It's the same concept and it can come back to bite the people if they're, not, if they're not aware of it. So the flip side of that equation is a president of an HOA that really wants to impress his or her next visitor with a fancy gate or a fancy fountain or whatever versus a president of an HOA that really just wants to keep operating costs down because they want to maximize their return on investment on the property that they are investing in that is being rented out, right? Well, I wouldn't even create that huge dichotomy. There's something in the middle there too, right? There's the president of the HOA who is all big on costs and is willing to bet that they're going to make it up and increase values of the homes later on, the okay. condos later on. That at the end of the day, that's their job is to protect the asset mm -hmm. for the owner. So they're thinking, well, listen, if we put this fancy thing here and this fancy thing here and fancy, fancy thing here, property values are going to rise so much that it's going to make sense for yeah. everybody. But that doesn't always equate that way. That's not the right decision for a lot of condos, right? The condo I was living in was not a very nice condo. Like it was certainly, I mean, it was just fresh out of college, right? So like there's a time and a place maybe where you do that, but for call it middle income, condos, you typically don't do that because what it does is it affects affordability. Mm. So 
but you've got the guy who's or girl who's trying to create all these fancy things to make it up in values. The area around there really needs to support those higher values. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a condo association that's doing kind of like, let's call it bare minimum, right? That's not necessarily a great thing either, right? Whenever you have a condo association, there are certain minimum standards that you need to keep in order to keep the investments healthy as well. Like for example, reserves. Yep. Like if you're not planning for reserves in your condo association, everybody's investment is at risk. If you're not planning for routine maintenance, right? Everybody's condos or townhouse can be at risk. And so you don't want to go down that route, right? Seeing the budget of your HOA is important. Having an impact on that is important to make sure you're prepared for that rainy day because everybody's investments is kind of pulled together there. And in, in, in a sense, there in a very minor sense where the right approach is to understand where that condo association or where that townhouse association is in relation to the overall marketplace. Is this one where if we put a pool and a fancy gate and everything else, the values are going to rise that much more? Or is this one where let's focus on providing the right services for today and for tomorrow and keeping the cost as low as possible while doing that, knowing that we can attract and that this is affordable, right? This is affordable and going to produce positive cash flow yep. for us. So that's really the middle ground. That's really what you're searching for. Like my experience in a condo association was when I bought my first, the only I guess it's now my first of four properties that I've purchased, but the only time I ever, like I owned my own residence was straight out of college, living in California, bought into this like condo conversion, ended up becoming elected condo president because I was just in a meeting where it was like a uh, retired post office worker right. and a nice little old lady that were like, yeah, I've got time to do this. And I was like, hey guys, I don't, you know, like I operate a local business here and I just feel like I'm hearing a bunch of things. And if you want somebody that thinks like me, I'll do it, but I don't really want to do this. And then I got elected it. None of us are real estate developers. Like right. none of us would have made informed real estate decisions. Right. I ended up leaving shortly thereafter because I got promoted and I was able to get out of that. Right. But me is the best option there. <laughs> I don't want to do it. Right. But I would not have been prepared to make a decision. Like if I was an investor that was counting on like positive cash flow of like a hundred bucks a month, mm -hmm. I would have been real upset. Yeah. If I was a family with kids, I would have been like, yeah, great. Now I got a pool. I can right. that, that, that yeah. already bought. Yeah. But what about the future buyers that are going to be buying in a year, two years, three years? Correct. Right? Correct. I would not have been able to make that decision. So that makes a ton of sense of having that and also having other people like me making those votes, yeah. right? So it's like the leadership that thinks like a real estate developer and then having everybody that has a stake in the game that's making the decision based on the same parameters, which is what I understand is kind of like the value prop of investing in a community that's a whole bunch of other investors as yeah. well. So let's talk about how we mitigate that risk because I'm sure some folks are saying, well, geez, what about investing in a townhouse with JWB, right? Townhomes are something that we've built. I don't know how many, but we started building them probably, geez, seven, eight years ago. And uh, we probably have hundreds and hundreds of clients that have purchased townhomes with us. So how do we mitigate that risk so that we don't, we don't have Pablo, the condo association <laughs> manager, managing your, your condo. 23 year old or, Pablo. Or 23 year old yeah, Pablo. Yeah. Who, who was, yeah. So, so how do we do that? Well, we have a dramatic amount of influence on those condo associations or townhome associations. Generally it's a townhome. So like, for example, one of the very first projects we ever did was this, large amount of land that was built out with two townhomes that were already built. They were built in like 2007. We bought the land in like 2011 or whatnot. And then for the next geez, eight, nine years, we built out the remaining townhome buildings on the remaining lands. So we, we finished that townhome project. And that's very similar to how a lot of the townhomes that JWB brings to you all come to be, right? In that case, we have a tremendous amount of influence. We actually set up the HOA for the townhome yeah. association. We vetted potential HOAs and we selected the townhome HOA because in order to, to do this, actually, we were the townhome HOA and that's not our cup of tea, right? We're going to hire the best of the best. And so we set up the decision-making body there. And then the other part of this is that if you think about that, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but let's just say that there were a hundred townhomes that we built. And there were probably like units, right? And there were probably 12 or 14 units that were already there in this townhome community that is now subject to the HOA of that townhome community. Every one of those owners is a JWB owner, 
who has a long-term mindset, who wants to be passive, just like Lee was talking about. And they, who do you think they come to when the idea comes up for a vote for the HOA or the budget or to put in the Taj Mahal and a gate and a pool and all this in the HOA? They don't say, hmm, let me think about this. Let me do my research and figure out what the market value is of that townhome community and what it could be. They say, hey, JWB portfolio manager, what do you think here? What is JWB recommending that we do? And we have one consistent message for all 100 units in that place. So we have a high degree of influence over that HOA, even though JWB, it's like we have created our own super shares. That's where I was headed. Yeah. I was like, that sounds like super shares to me, right? We've created our own super shares in that example. And and so that's one way. It's okay. Listen, if you're getting the super shares, we like that, right? (laughs) Agreed, right? Like that's the point.